Great night. Hey, how about just turn the person next to you or around you, give them a fist bump or a high five, tell them I'm glad you're here. Just, you know, spread the love around a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Nothing like, nothing like a good fist bump, you know what I'm saying, to show some love, a high five. Hey, I'm really glad all of you guys are here tonight. It is, it is a beautiful thing to listen to this group lift up praises to Jesus on Wednesday. So thank you for awkwardly joining with me in that call and response prayer. But this has been a beautiful time of worship. And I always look forward to Wednesday nights and our time together and what God is going to do because God is moving here. He's moving in your hearts. He's moving through this community. And I want to keep pouring gasoline on that fire as we look into God's word about what he wants to teach us about how we can love people more like Jesus. Because what we've been talking about, if you're new and you're joining us, is we've been looking at what the Bible says about love. And it's a much better story about love then maybe what we've heard from the world around us or maybe what we even grew up with in our home. Some of you guys were gifted with some incredible families. Other of you come from very broken homes. Wherever you're from, we none of us grew up with a perfect version of love because everybody's messed up. There's no perfect family. And a part of us growing up into maturity in our lives is really looking at what does God say about love and realizing he's inviting us into a better story. And so a little pop quiz. We started this series off. I know some of you guys are joining us new. Uh, what do you know about what the Bible says about love? Okay, so why did God send Jesus in the world? For God so? Hey, you guys have got it. What did Jesus say is the most important thing in life, Ryan? To love, to love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How did Paul say we know we are being filled with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God? that we would love one another. How is God defined? God is? We're doing great with the call and response tonight. You guys are doing awesome. And what did Jesus say his followers would be known for? Love. And after I shared these verses the first night, a friend of mine said, we need to talk about this more often. Because sometime in the church, we're known for the opposite of this. And what we need to be known for is what Jesus says about love. Not just a I love tacos kind of love. Like, I do love tacos. I love burritos. But the kind of love that Jesus shows us. The Bible defines love as agape, a self-giving, a sacrificial love. It has a certain shape to it. And as followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, we are meant to be known by that kind of love overflowing out of us. The Christian life is not just about rules and regulations. It's about the love of God transforming our heart so that we would overflow in love to the people in our lives. We're invited into a better story about love. And if that's something that you're trying to grow in and you want to learn some practices that might be able to help you live in that love in your everyday daily life, that's what we're going to be focused on at the retreat this weekend. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. It's going to be a chance to slow down. We're busy people, right? And sometimes we get going so fast, we forget to breathe in the love of God that's right here with us. And we need to be intentional about that if we want our soul to be filled with love rather than fear or all the other things it can be filled with. So can you guys just take a deep breath with me? Just breathe in real quick. Now breathe it out. And I love that in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is spirit. He's as close as breath. And we're always invited to breathe. Sometimes when you're feeling stress or anxiety, I know some of you guys came in here tonight feeling stress and anxiety. I had one person reach out to me about coming to Yam this week and was like, I kind of got social anxiety. I know it's a big group. I'm like, hey, we got other people with lots of anxiety issues here. You're not alone. But just to take a, a deep breath. And when we're feeling stress and anxiety, we can, we, can, we can turn our hearts and turn our attention to God. And this time of worship is meant to help us practice do that. To, to help us remember that we're not alone and that God is with us all the time. And that's why we gather together to help us be reminded of the truth of his word and the, the promise of his presence being with us so we can be filled with that in our daily life. So tonight, I want to actually get a little more practical. I want to talk about how we can actually grow in loving each other more like Jesus in our everyday relationships, whether it's friendships, family, dating. We're actually going to talk about seven tips to finding the love of your life. No, we're not going to do that, actually. You know, when, when you go to the Bible, like, 
this whole, like, conversation about dating, for those of you guys who are single or dating or interested in dating or what, whatever that confusing world that you're in, like, there, there isn't a book in the Bible about that, right? You can't turn to the book of dating, and you can't just find seven magic principles to find the love of your life. Like, that doesn't exist. But what we do find is a pattern of how we're called to love each other and treat each other in relationships that will radically change the way we think about dating, the way we think about our friendships, our family, and if God calls us to be married, how we love each other in our marriages and how we love our kids in the future. And Jesus wants us to get a clear picture of how we can grow in that, wherever we are in that journey. So that's what I want to dig into tonight. And so I want to look at a passage in Philippians chapter 2 where we see very clearly the way Jesus loves. And it's a passage that was written to a community that was actually struggling with some division. Do you guys know in churches people can fight? They can some. Why can't we all just get along? You know, but there's problems. We get people together. You gather together. People start having problems and issues. And Paul's writing to the church to remind them of the way they're to love each other. And right in the center of this reminder, he puts this pattern of the way Jesus lived as the center point of their community that we're always called back to because none of us are perfect. We we mess it up. And so this is known as the Christ hymn. Some uh, people that study the Bible actually think this is the oldest song that was ever sung by Christians. And it was memorized to help them know really how Jesus lived, what Jesus did for them, and then how they're called to love each other as they follow him. So we're going to go to Philippians 2. And what I want to do is I'm going to read this to you guys. And I want to just invite you, if you want to close your eyes and just listen to it, you can. If you want to read along on the screen, you can. We're going to read this in our groups later and talk about it. But I'd love for you just to listen and pay attention to what's like something God's highlighting for you in this about what it means to love. And if we actually follow Jesus in this way, what would our relationships be like? How would the world be different? So let me read. I'm going to get there. says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a long passage. But you notice the, the hymn right in the middle about Jesus and how they are called to follow him and their example as a community. I mean, the first thing that jumps out to me, I don't know what word jumped out to you. Where did that thing go? I, I, I lost my, there it is. Yeah, I'm going to use this. Uh, the first thing that jumped out to me is that we are called to practice humility. If we want to really love someone, if we want to have healthy relationships, if we want to follow the pattern of Jesus in our life, then we have to wrap our mind and hearts around this idea of humility. And humility is really a countercultural concept today, is it not? We live in a culture of self-promotion, of self-expression, of self-exaltation. And the idea of humbling ourselves, it's a radically different way to live. But when you think about it, think about your relationships. When a relationship has gone sideways, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a family relationship, whether it's a dating relationship, couldn't you attribute where it went wrong to somebody being selfish, someone being prideful. Maybe it was you. Last week, we did a little survey, and I asked, anybody ever done anything dumb in a relationship before? Okay, 
little survey. Anybody done anything dumb in a relationship before? Okay, some people got both hands raised. Some people got one hand raised. All of us have done something dumb in a relationship before because we all have this problem in our hearts that's called selfishness. And what the Bible says, the root of that is sin, right? And so we all have this problem inside of us that bends us towards selfishness rather than selflessness, humility. And humility is really at the core of learning to love someone. And we're trained by this, honestly, because we swim in this culture all the time of self. I, I like to joke with my wife that we gave our kids tools for narcissism when they got to middle school because they have these cell phones, right? And we, we, we as parents are... We're, di- we're not as, like, legalistic as some people. There's no one ra- right way to handle, like, cell phone usage once you get to that age. But, like, we want our kids to learn how to use that stuff while they're in our house. And so we've given them some guidance on it, and they have to learn how to handle the boundaries and, and navigate that world. But, man, it is, like, you guys know it can be all-consuming. I mean, if you just think about, like, the amount of t- how much time do you spend scrolling on social media? Maybe some of you have developed some practice and say, I'm not, I'm not going to waste time on that but if we actually can track it now right (laughs) like you can look at your time and how much time do you spend scrolling through social media compared to meditating on God's word like there's just this vortex that can suck us in to something to kind of numb our brain and rather than going to the things that can bring health to our soul right and that's the culture that we live in it's like warring against us it's fighting against us pulling us into this this drowning pool of narcissism and we can have this implicit, like, feeling underneath the surface that, man, I just don't measure up to whatever the standard is out here. We're comparing ourselves to other people. And humility is actually having a right view of yourself before God. Is knowing your value to the God who made you, not for the world around you. And not comparing yourself to other people. Alice is giving me some preach over there. And then being able to treat other people out of a place of selflessness rather than selfishness. Jesus wants to form our souls to have humility, but it fights against us. And I share this picture. We're all trained to kind of be dumb. You guys, if you've seen the movie Dumb and Dumber, um, this is a picture of me as a kid, and my wife actually put this together, um, that she thinks I was raised to be dumb. And so we all have a lot of uh, things to fight against, depending on how we're raised. And our culture just, just raises us dumb and that's that's the world we live in and we we can overcome that jesus wants to teach us how to be humble i mean when you listen to that description of Christ, how christian community is supposed to be how we're called to treat each other i mean how refreshing was that when you you listen to the example of jesus i mean you probably have heard the phrase before that absolute power corrupts or power corrupts but absolute power corrupts absolutely but in in the person of jesus you see the the absolute opposite of that. The one with all the power and authority that created the heavens and the earth, he left heaven, humbled himself, became one of us to fully identify with us as human beings and to lay his life down in love. I mean, isn't humility what made Jesus so attractive? I mean, he, he loved the outcasts. He didn't call the elite and the powerful. He called the fishermen and the tax collectors and, and the sinners. Anybody who was willing to follow him could be his disciples, people like you and me. And Jesus was the most humble servant leader. Did you know that they've studied, like, um, different levels of corporations? And they, from, like, level one to level five, most successful companies, nonprofits, businesses. And at the top of, of, the, of kind of like the success pyramid are known as level five organizations. And it's those organizations have leaders at the top that are servant leaders that put the mission and the people that they're serving ahead of their own interests. It's so interesting that when people begin following Jesus, even if they don't know they're following Jesus, the world changes for the better. I mean, think about your workplace. If someone treats you with humility, how good does that feel? When they they think about your interests and they care about you ahead of themselves as opposed to just making you a part of their machine or just demanding you do things a certain way. I mean, the opposite of humility really hurts. And it's at the the heart of what goes wrong in so many relationships. And Jesus wants to teach us a better way. He's inviting us into a better story where we learn to treat each other with humility. So how do we do that? How do we actually develop 
that quality in our life. I love how practical Jesus gets about this in his most famous sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. You guys familiar with the Sermon on the Mount? A sermon on the Mount, if you're new to the Bible, was like Jesus' manifesto for what life in his kingdom really looks like. And he's teaching us about how we're to relate to him and what his followers are called to do and, and how we overcome all the things that human beings deal with, from anger to lust to fear to anxiety to worry about money. And he addresses all these very practical topics. And then at the end, he starts getting really, like, real about the things that can get in the way of living this out in community together. And at the beginning of Matthew 7, he says, don't judge or you too will be judged. And then he used this really interesting image. He says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First go and rid the log in your own eye. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Isn't that a striking image? What Jesus is saying is that this, this judgmental spirit towards one another, this prideful spirit towards one another, can really get in the way of love. It's like seeing a speck in somebody's eye with a log sticking out of your own. Do you not, are you thinking about that for a second? What does that look like? Okay, here's a picture of me and my wife giving a talk about this at our marriage class, Reengage. That's my wife, Danielle. We've been married for about 20 years. And, I mean, do you think she would trust me to get a speck out of her eye with that sticking out of mine? No, right? Like, there's no way she would do that. And Jesus is saying this is how we can be towards one another when we're filled with pride. And so the first thing that we need to do to, to really grow in humility is be willing to take the log out of our eye, to admit, hey, I've got issues, I've got problems, I've got sin in my heart, and that's a bigger deal than the specks in your eye. Because have you ever noticed that when you get close to people, it's almost easier to see what's wrong with them than is wrong with you? It's something inside of us that wants to judge other people and play God in other people's lives without paying attention to what God wants to do in our soul. And to really build trust and love with someone, we have to have humility. And if you want to know if there's someone you should date and you should trust them, you should see them taking the plank out of their eye. You should see them admitting when they make a mistake. You should see them own up to their wrongs. Because we all blow, we all mess up. But if we're not willing to humble ourselves and say, I'm sorry, hey, I shouldn't have talked to you like that, I, I'm sorry for misunderstanding you, whatever it is, and to take responsibility for it, then we're not going to be able to build a trusting, loving relationship. And do you know how healing it is in a friendship or a dating relationship or a marriage when someone just admits that, even if they've been hard-hearted and they've totally messed it up for a long time and they just come back to you and they say, hey, you know what? I'm really sorry for the way I've been treating you. And they get specific about it. They take the plank out of their eye. It starts to create healing. It starts to rebuild trust. This is the foundation to loving each other. And the opposite of that feels awful. And we shouldn't trust someone that is trying to poke at the speck in our eye when there's a log sticking out of theirs. And we probably all experience that. And so this is one of the first things we do in our marriage class uh, called re-engage. And I'm going to draw on, on the board right now a circle. I like circles and triangles, Greg. Sorry to disappoint you. So the first thing we do in our marriage class, so uh, you're getting uh, early uh, not many of you guys are married in here. I know there's a few of you, but most of you are single. There's a few, few folks that are married. But in our marriage class, the first exercise that we have couples do is this. They write the word me on a piece of paper, and they draw a circle around it. This is the person in the relationship they're allowed to work on to change. And they put a, then their spouse draws a circle around themselves. And they say, this is the person you're allowed to work on and change. Now, when you start getting into other per person's circle, we're going to call time out. That's, that's outside the rules, okay? Because what we do, so much of our stress and anxiety in our life and what goes wrong in our relationships 
is we try to change somebody else. We try to fix someone else. I mean, how many people get into a relationship thinking, I can be their savior, I can fix them, I can change them? No, they are who they are. The only, the only person that can take responsibility for asking God to change you is you. We are called to love each other, to listen to each other, to care for each other, to communicate with each other, sometimes to call each other out, to challenge each other. But only you can ask God to change you. You are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and maturity. And that's not to say that what someone has done to you has, isn't hurtful, or you might not need to set a boundary in an unhealthy situation. But you're responsible for responding to that in your life and learning how to deal with it. We can't control everything that happens to us in our lives, but we can control how we respond to it and how we ask God to help us navigate our way through it and how we need to learn and grow. And so if you're coming out of a pattern of unhealthy relationships, of not having a solid foundation of love, you really need to start here. Draw a circle around yourself and say, Lord, what is the plank I need to take out of my eye? What is the thing I need to see differently about myself so I can grow and change and my character can develop the humility so I can see a person that I can build trust and love in a healthy relationship with? And what happens is we just start bouncing from relationship to relationship to relationship, but do you know who we take with us? Me. And until something changes in our hearts, then our relationships aren't going to change. We're keep repeating the same patterns over and over. And so the foundation of willing to love people like Jesus is to have humility. And you know what's amazing? Is Jesus' humility, it is a, the greatest love story ever told. That he left heaven and humbled himself out of love for you and me. Because he saw the mistakes that we would make he saw that plank sticking out of our eye, and he said, you're worth dying for. I'm going to go to the cross for your mistakes so you don't have to live in guilt and shame and regret anymore, and you can learn a new way. And so now we can follow his example. We can learn to practice humility, and we're not always going to get it right, but we can grow and learn. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, did you notice? We're called to practice compassion with one another. To be, oh, I'm going to skip that. Actually, no, we'll go back to there. Here's a few things you can do to practice humility. You can take responsibility for your thoughts, feelings, and mistakes. You can differentiate. Differentiate is the fancy counseling word for knowing you're responsible for yourself. That this the person you're in a relationship with is different than you. And you can't demand them to change. Be patient rather than defensive. We can put walls up and be really defensive rather than listening to somebody else. We can listen and not just talk. Ooh. Did you guys notice, like, Jesus is amazing at asking questions? Do you notice the way God created you? He gave you two ears and one mouth. Hey, guys or girls, if you're ever on a date with somebody and they don't ask you a question, bad sign. Okay, just say it. Bad sign. Guys, girls, we need to get better at asking questions, getting to know each other, being curious, listening more than we talk. That we can serve first rather than expecting the other to serve you. We can give and receive forgiveness, and we can work through issues with respect. These things take practice, but it's worth it. This is what makes healthy relationships. And then we, we're meant to practice compassion. Or practice compassion. What's compassion? Compassion... Is, is seeing someone and loving them for who they are, of getting on their level and caring about the issues that are beneath the surface in their life. And wasn't Jesus amazing at that? I mean, Jesus fully identified with us as people, and he cared for the broken, and he healed the sick. He had compassion that was so inspiring and amazing. And we're not perfect like Jesus, but we can learn to practice compassion in our lives. We can learn to care about the things that are going on in each other's hearts, and we can be curious about those things. And that's a part of what makes a really healthy relationship, is when you know someone really cares about you. you, you even when it comes to, like, 
uh, anything you're a part of, if you're a part of a team or you're a part of an organization or you're a part of a church, people don't care how much you know until they know you care about them, right? And that's what I love about Jesus. He didn't just tell us what to do. He showed us. And he, he doesn't just tell us what to do now in an impersonal book. He gives us his Holy Spirit to comfort us in our hearts so we experience God's compassion deep within us when we believe in him. And there's this never-ending well of compassion that we can draw from and learn to share with each other. This last weekend, I was at a dance convention because my youngest daughter is a dancer. And I had a lot of free time because anybody a dancer in here? Anybody ever do, like, uh, the arts growing up or anything like that? No, maybe a lot of you. You know, you do your thing, but then there's a lot of downtime for those who are, are there to support you. And so I read a whole book. It was pretty amazing. I'm, I'm a, kind of a dirt nerd. But I watched my daughter dance, and then I was reading a book. And the whole book was on the, how we can grow in the art of seeing each other, of really knowing each other. And his whole point, this guy, like, traveled uh, the country interviewing people that are the best at creating spaces for people to experience love and compassion and feeling seen and heard and understood. And he just wrote a book about how we can do that better. I was like, this is super interesting. And this is what he found. I'm going to go to this quote. Yeah. He said, there's one skill that lies at the heart of healthy, a healthy person, family, school, community, organization, or society. The ability to see someone else deeply and make them feel seen. To accurately know another person. To let them feel valued, heard, and understood. That's the heart of being a good person and the ultimate gift that you can give to others and to yourself. I think this guy, he was onto something that Jesus said in that plank eye image, right? Take the plank out of your eye and then what? You can see clearly to help your brother and sister with the speck in theirs. Because the truth is, we do need help with our issues. And we need brothers and sisters to have compassion on us. Maybe the lies that we believe that keep us from seeing clearly Maybe the issues or the trauma that we've had in our life that's created wounds and hurt that keep us from knowing how to love and trusting other people. We need people that care about us, that see us, because, you know, specks hurt. Have you ever had a speck in your eye? They are not comfortable. And you would not want someone helping you with that speck if they have that plank in their eye. But once they do, you would hope your friend would help you, right, if you can't get it out yourself. But how do they help you? With so much tenderness. You want someone poking around in your eye? (laughs) No. You got to get really close. And so in in Christian community, in our relationships with each other, we're meant to practice compassion. And that's the heart of developing a healthy relationship with a spouse, with a dating relationship, is we're all going to have issues. There is no perfect person out there. But we're meant to show Jesus compassion to one another, care about each other, and to help each other with the specks in our eyes, that's a part of why God puts us together in community. And there's this skill that we need to develop to learn how to do that. And it's, it's described in one of Paul's letters in Ephesians. He, he says this. He said, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work, it helps the other part grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing full of love. Like, full stop for a second, if the church really lived like this, loneliness in our culture wouldn't be as big of an issue as it was. If we really saw each other as the body of Christ, that we're interconnected together, we're brothers and sisters in a family, and we're meant to, hey, when I haven't seen someone in a couple weeks at YAM, like, I'm going to call them, I'm going to text them, because my, my brother or sister is missing, that we're welcoming each other, we're getting to know each other's stories, we're, we're really loving each other, seeing each other, knowing each other. We're meant to be a body together. But you know, when you get groups of people together, when you get a dating couple or you get a community together, there's going to be issues. And the skill that we have to develop to practice compassion is speaking the truth in love. And here's what we do. We usually do some of that but not all of that. Some of us in here, we're really good at speak the truth part. You you see that person coming, you're like, they're going to tell me the truth, but it might not be in love. And some of you guys are really good at speaking love. Like, you'll be compassionate and gentle and tender, but you'll never call somebody out on something that they did wrong to you or confront a difficult issue. And if you have an issue with somebody, 
you ain't get used to gonna stop talking to them. And that happens so many times. As soon as there's any friction in a relationship or a Christian community, we're out. And sometimes the best story is on the other side of speaking the truth in love. Because maybe the, guy, the person's just blind. They don't know that they hurt you. They don't know that they have that issue. And when you go to them and you work it through, then the body grows together. And that's how Jesus designed it to work. And for, for me, like in my marriage, my wife is more the truth teller. That's actually one of the reasons why I fell in love with her. Because I had a lot of people that told me what I wanted to hear about myself, things that felt good. But Danielle, I could trust she was always going to tell me the truth. But she's had to learn to communicate that in a more gracious, respectful way. And I'm more the speak the world. Like, I, I want everybody to get along and be happy. And I want to be gracious. And I've had to learn how to have the courage to tell the truth. Wherever you are in, in this journey, this is the skill we have to develop to practice compassion. And then the third thing that jumps out is to practice obedience. Do you notice Jesus emptied himself out of love for you and me, out of obedience to who? The Father. And why? Because he's known the Father since before the world was even created. He knows how much the Father loves the world. He loves you, and he loves him. And so it's out of joy that he laid his life down for you and me to show us how much love the Father has for you. Jesus died for our sins to demonstrate his love. He gave himself out of obedience to Father because God loves you that much, that he wants to be with you. And if we're going to learn to practice the love of Jesus, to, to follow Jesus into the lives of others and love others like him, it's got to come out of a place of obedience to God, not just trying to get other people to like us. Because that's a secure place. And when you think about it, it's so much easier in our culture to not act in obedience, to, to just kind of settle for easy, superficial relationships, to, you know, get on Tinder or whatever the cool kid app is today and find somebody that you can hook up with and have just a, a fun time but no depth and no meaning. It's so much easier in our culture to get married to someone and then give up when things get hard. You'll get affirmation for that. It's so much easier in our culture to bounce from church to church looking for a place that's going to meet your needs than actually being committed to building up a community and working through the issues in love. It's so much easier in our culture to settle for friendships that never challenge each other and just kind of stay up here. And Jesus is inviting us to something so much better where we actually push each other, where we encourage each other, where we spur one another on to love and good deeds out of obedience to the Father who gave us his Son. And that's the kind of life that we're longing for deep down. But sometimes it's easier just to settle for something more comfortable. And sometimes it's because we've been hurt. I love how C.S. Lewis says this in his book about love. He says, love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your own selfishness, but in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It'll become unbreakable impenetrable and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. And Jesus invites us to learn how to love like that. Jesus emptied himself. He gave himself because he trusted his Father would lift him back up again. And because he did, he was given the name that was above every name, the name that every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's inviting us to make that confession now because it's good news. And he wants us to, to teach us how to love like him, to empty ourselves, to give of ourselves, so that when we look back at our lives, we poured out everything in us for love, for love for God and love for the people around us. That's the life that we're longing for. And that word is what Jesus summarizes in Philippians 2. It's that word kenosis. It's at the heart of that hymn. 
It's what he means by self-giving, self-emptying love. And he's inviting us to follow that same path. To make it really simple, Jesus said this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's the invitation. To learn to lay our life down like Jesus and love, to practice obedience. And it's not easy, and we need each other for this. We need each other's help and support because the truth is every one of us has battles and struggles going on underneath the surface that maybe you haven't let anybody in on. And God sees that, and he knows, and he cares, and that's why he gave Jesus to show you how much he loves you. But as you open up, as you begin to trust other people with what's really in your heart, you begin to heal. You begin to grow. You, you, instead of locking your heart away in this impenetrable fortress so it won't get hurt again, you see that love is worth it and that God's not done with your story. And maybe the hurt of your past is going to be the source of healing for some of the most beautiful things in your future. And that's what we're meant to help each other find in Christian community because with Jesus, anything's possible. And he has a better story about love. And so we're going to spend some time in groups just talking together about what this means in our lives in a bit. But I just want to give you one final encouragement before we go. If you're here and you're married, I know there's a few of you married, God wants you to know that it is worth it to work through the hard things. It's worth it to work through the hard things, to learn how to love each other. And our culture really does just give so much affirmation for when things get hard, just give up. And Jesus wants so much more for you than that. When me and Danielle were two years into our marriage, we needed to get some help um, from counseling. And I went to a gathering um, kind of like this with a lot of uh, ministry workers. And they gave one of those prayer invitations. You know how we do at the end of YAM. Sometimes we give opportunities to pray with somebody if you're struggling. And they gave a specific invitation if there were any married couples struggling. You can go. There will be people around the room. You can, they can pray for you. And I was like, hey, you want to go? And she just looked at me like death stare. It's like, we are not moving from the seat. And I was like, all right. So I just sat there, and I was like, I, Lord, I'm just going to pray, okay, because you're, you're here with us. And this guy from about where Greg was over there in the couch, didn't Greg do a great job leading worship? How about that? He sees me, and he comes over to us while we're sitting there in the chair, and he goes, hey, I, I noticed you guys sitting there. Would you mind if I just prayed for you? And I was like, sure. And uh, Danielle just looked down, and uh, <laughs> he just put his hand on her shoulder and started praying. And that was the first time in my life I'd ever experienced someone knowing specific things about me who had never met me before. He knew exactly what we were going through. And what the, that's what the Bible calls a, a prophetic word. And he was able just to speak hope into our soul. And I'll never forget what he said. Is in your heart right now, you're feeling tempted to give up, and this is going to be too hard. But the Lord wants you to know you can trust him with her. When Danielle and I were engaged, if, you're, if you ever are blessed to get married, and yet you should go through premarital counseling, and we had some stuff come up in our premarital counseling process. And it was hard, and so I went to her and said, hey, we've got some hard things that we need to, to work through, and maybe we need to give this a little more time. And she took her ring off and gave it to me. And she said, I understand what you're saying. We do have some issues. But you either love me with all my issues, and you're willing to work through this, or you're not. So I went home that night with the ring. And I prayed all night. I couldn't sleep. And I just wrestled with God. And the Holy Spirit said to me, do you love her? And I said, yeah. And then he said, you can trust me with her. So the next morning I went and I proposed to her again. And she said yes. And <laughs> I'm so glad that we were just committed to the hard things of working through the issues together. Because the truth is, I think we're all thinking we're going to find some perfect person that's not going to have issues. But there's no person like that. But if you are going to get married... You, you just need to be committed to building a foundation of love. And that's where the most beautiful stories come from. And if you're here and you're single and you're like, you know what? I'm not really interested in dating or marriage. 
that's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. The Bible not, says not everyone's called to be married or to, to be in a relationship. We're, we actually can find love and belonging and incredible acceptance in Christian community together. Like, you're not less than if you're not in a relationship with somebody else. But if you're here and you do, that's the desire of your heart. You want to find someone that you can date and that you can eventually marry. Like, don't settle for less than finding someone that you can build a healthy foundation with. And that foundation is only found in Jesus. And when you find someone like that, it's worth it to work through the issues. And God can redeem the trauma and the hurt and the baggage that you carry with you to build something beautiful together. And that's not an easy process. I actually have to learn from you guys what it's like to be a young adult in today's culture. It's not, I talk to you, some of you guys, it's hard. It's hard to know where to meet people. It's hard to know who you can trust, and you're not going to always get it right. But that's why we need each other. So you can have people that can be with you in that journey. And it always makes me nervous when I see somebody get into a relationship and no one else knows that person, and then all of a sudden they're spending all this time together, and you can really deceive yourself about whether somebody is good to trust or not. So we need each other in Christian community to help each other really practice the way of Jesus, to practice humility and compassion and obedience. So I want to pray for you, and then we'll have a chance to talk about this together in groups. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his way of love that's so beautiful and so attractive and so compelling. Would you help us to follow you, to take up our cross, deny yourself, and trust your love and learn to love like you? And would you provide for us in the ways that we need you? For those who are here and they're struggling in their marriage, I pray that you give them strength that you increase their love and intimacy together. If there's people here who are struggling with finding someone to trust in a dating relationship, and that's the desire of your heart, I pray that you would provide for them that person, that you would help them to wait on you, and that they would trust you. And God, I pray for those who are here who are struggling with maybe the mistakes they've made in the past. I pray to God that they could experience forgiveness and hope that they can have a new future. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.